Hi, I'm Theron Plummer. I'm a philosopher at the University of St. Andrews and director of the Center for Ethics, Philosophy and Public Affairs, or CEPA. Today, I'm speaking with Helen Fro of the University of Stockholm. Helen is a professor of philosophy and director of the Stockholm Center for the Ethics of War and Peace. This is a topic that Helen has written on widely. And today we'll be focusing on the moral status of civilians in war and whether that status differs at all from that of soldiers. Asking you your thoughts on what's probably the most widely held view in this area, which, which is that there is a moral distinction between civilians and soldiers, um, and that it's impermissible to target civilians, but permissible to target soldiers in the context of war. Um, this seems to be the sort of common sense view, the view that's most widely held. So what's wrong with this view? Well, we want to know why there's this difference. Um, and the problem is that it's hard to come up with an explanation of what would be the morally significant difference between civilians and soldiers that could ground these different permissions that we seem to have regarding what we can do to each of them. So one reason this is difficult is because um, it's not clear that there's anything that soldiers do that civilians don't also do. Now, I mean, the obvious thing that people point to is to say, well, civilians um, don't pose threats in war, um, but soldiers do. And this seems like a kind of an easy way to carve them up. But um, one problem with this is that not all soldiers pose sort of direct threats in war. Um, lots of soldiers fight behind the front lines, right? They provide logistical support and intelligence support and, and training and so on. Um, so what you have to have is an account of what it is to pose a threat that's quite broad if you think that the soldiers are nonetheless legitimate targets. You've got to have this uh, a notion of posing a threat that covers all these ways, indirect forms of posing a threat. But if that's true, um, then we need to think about the types of contributions that civilians make. And civilians make lots of contributions during a war. And so it looks like actually civilians will also count as posing threats. Um, so this is one of the reasons why it's problematic to just kind of assert this, this view that civilians don't pose threats in war because, well, clearly they do make contributions. And you can say, well, it's only the people on the front lines doing the killing that really counts as legitimate targets. But if you do that, then you make it impermissible to target most of the armed forces in many cases. And people don't seem to want to do that either. So what you need is some kind of morally significant feature of civilians or of soldiers that explains why they, there are these different permissions. And it's actually quite difficult, surprisingly difficult, to come up with this feature. Right, so what about the more modest position um, defended by Seth Lazar that, that does make some exceptions? It says that sometimes it is permissible to attack civilians and sometimes it's impermissible to attack soldiers, but nonetheless maintains this general distinction between civilians and soldiers, claiming that it's morally worse to attack civilians than it is to attack soldiers. What do you make of that seemingly more modest position? You call this a more modest view. I'm not sure why we'd think it's a more modest view. I mean, this is a view that basically says, you're right, this, this is Seth Lazar's view. And um, he thinks that even if you're killing on, so you, if you're an, an unjust combatant fighting an unjust war and you're killing people who are on the just side, he thinks that even when we're talking about killing either just combatants or just civilians, it's worse to kill the just civilians. But what that means is that here you've got a bunch of people, none of whom have forfeited their rights against being harmed. Right? So nobody here is engaged in impermissible behavior. The soldiers are engaged in a justified defense. And for some reason, we think that the fact that some of these people, the soldiers, have put themselves in harm's way in order to protect the others makes it easier to justify killing them, or that it would be worse to kill the, the civilians rather than the soldiers. And that just doesn't seem like a modest view to me. That seems like quite a strange view to think that out of these people, none of whom have lost any of their normal rights, it's somehow worse to kill one rather than the other, particularly if what you think is that it's worse to kill the people who are endangering themselves in order to protect others. So I don't think that is a more modest view. I mean, I think that there's, um, um, there's various kind of problems with the kind of picture that, that Lazar sketches, but I also think we should be careful about thinking that just because a, a philosophical view is closer to our current practice, this somehow in itself makes it more plausible. 
Um, there could just be that our current practice is, is wrong. And so the fact that this is more modest in the sense of being less revisionary doesn't mean that it's more likely to be true. So then what is the correct view of the status of civilians in war? I, I do think that we should um, take quite a critical approach to how people have um, traditionally thought about the, the role and the status of, of civilians in war for the reasons that I alluded to about um, contributing to unjust wars. So there's lots of ways in which civilians knowingly contribute to unjust wars. And I think that if we think about general plausible principles about who's a legitimate target of defensive force, it's going to include people who indirectly contribute to other people posing unjust threats. Um, so this seems true in um, I mean, a drive-by shooting case, for example, right? It's not just the person who's holding the gun who's a legitimate target. The driver is also a legitimate target. And I think that if I've given them the gun so that they can carry out the shooting, then I'm also a legitimate target of defensive force. So once we get away from the idea that only direct perpetrators can be legitimate targets, um, it looks obvious that actually lots of civilians are going to be candidates for defense, defensive force in light of the fact that they knowingly make causal contributions, substantial often um, causal contributions, to the unjust threats that soldiers pose in war. But isn't there something that's still special about the status of soldiers in that they've contracted into being soldiers in the war? That's the difference between them and civilians, as the civilians haven't signed up for it. Um, it just doesn't seem very persuasive. I mean, it's not as if we give, say, soldiers in the British Army a choice about which rules they want to sign up to, right? So the choice then is simply, imagine uh, British soldiers wondering whether to fight against Nazi aggression in World War II. The choice isn't, well, here's a, a range of rules that you might sign up to, which ones do you want to agree to? It's just either, if you fight, then these are the rules. Um, you make yourself a legitimate target um, on the part of the German soldiers. Now, the fact that people do it because they realize that if they don't, there'll be these grave moral harms that will be perpetrated by the Nazi regime doesn't seem to make it easier to justify killing them, right? The fact that you're coerced into, effectively into needing to defend yourself and other people against these very grave, unjust harms, the fact that you agree to do that doesn't weaken your rights. Um, so I just don't think it's plausible to drew soldiers as kind of waiving their rights against being harmed by agreeing to fight. Because that's like thinking that when I engage in self-defense um, against some unjust attacker, that because now I'm using force against you, well, we've just kind of waived our rights. Now, of course, people do make this move that you've suggested of thinking, well, there's something special about war. Um, but again, I just don't think that's true. I don't think that the fact that now we're in this state of war, which you know, is again, it's quite hard to often define when we're at war and when we're not. So that's one problem with this view is that you'd need to have some account of what counts as a war. Um, but also it's just really hard to see how the fact of being at war could itself affect this kind of change in people's rights. So in your view, would civilians who are members of aggressor countries be liable to attack in virtue of being voters? The thought being that they might be responsible for the way certain votes turned out in virtue of being part of that democracy? So I think this is a good question. I think this is one of the um, sort of uh, most controversial upshots of a view like mine, where you have this quite expansive view about who could be liable in terms of knowingly contributing to unjust threats. So, it, so uh, civilians don't just, for example, vote. Um, they also pay taxes. And wars are funded primarily through taxes. Um, so lots of civ civilians are making these contributions. And if what's happening with these contributions is that they're being used to unjustly kill other people, then it does seem to me like there's a good case for thinking that at least some of these people are going to be legitimate targets. Now, there's reasons why um, it could nonetheless be impermissible to kill even someone who's liable to be killed. So, um, for example, civilians are often caught up in a broader civilian population, right? They're not on a battlefield. And if you've got children, for example, who, on my view, aren't ever liable to be killed, then it looks like you would often cause disproportionate collateral harm, for example, if you tried to start taking out civilians. Um, often it also wouldn't do any good, right? So these contributions lie in the past, and so you can't now prevent them. If they've already voted and they're not doing anything else, then killing them isn't going to stop them from contributing. And, and if they're not making current contributions to the war effort, it could be that killing them just won't have any effect. Um, but I don't think that there's a kind of, um, or at least I haven't seen any, Nobody's given me an argument yet for where the, exactly the cutoff point should be or what types of causal contribution you're allowed to make or how much of a causal contribution. It certainly doesn't seem like 
um, say, paying your taxes, so financially funding wrongdoing, doesn't seem like it's just the sort of thing that couldn't ground liability to defensive harm. Um, and the same with voting. I mean, voting's an interesting case. Voting's partic particularly hard because it's so often overdetermined. Um, and so it's hard in voting cases to know who made a difference and who, in fact, causally contributed. So these are kind of, these are difficult cases. Um, but there are also plenty of more straightforward cases of clear material contributions in which it's not hard to know who contributed. Uh, again, there could be reasons why it's all things, in consider all things considered impermissible to target civilians, but it does seem to me that civilians can forfeit their rights, just like soldiers can, by contributing to unjust threats. Are you not worried that if people accept your view, that this will increase the risks of wrongful harming in the context of war? I mean, if people accepted my view, right, this is just one part of a more comprehensive view about the permissibility of fighting in wars. So, for example, my view holds that it's impermissible for soldiers to fight in unjust wars. And so if everybody took this seriously and soldiers thought, well, this war seems unjust, so I, I'm not going to fight in it, plausibly we just have fewer wars. Right? So if everybody had internalised something like this view, it doesn't seem like this is going to give rise to more wrongful killing, especially given that the current system we have permits very widespread collateral harms, for example. Um, there's plenty of conflict going on under the current legal regime. So one of the problems here is that it's hard to know what would happen with um, different laws compared to the ones that we have at the moment because you can't kind of test these things. And so knowing what the consequences would be of a different law is kind of it's guesswork. Um, so we're often one of the, the criticisms of a view like mine is often that it can't have practical relevance because you shouldn't change the law to reflect these things, these views. And so because it would make things worse overall. But that claim that it would make things worse overall is just an empirical claim that it's very hard to test. Um, so uh, Victor Tadros has done some interesting work recently really trying to address this question of what it would look like um, if we change some of the laws of war, and at least sort of making the case that actually um, there's not really good reason, A, to think the laws we've got at the moment are anything like the best laws we could have, or to think that things would go significantly worse if we changed the laws. So we should remember that on the kind of view that I hold, at the moment the laws permit widespread unjust killing because they allow combatants to kill even those combatants who are fighting a just war. So it's not as if at the moment the laws we have really restrict unjust killing. And they also permit widespread collateral damage, right? Most of the casualties in, in war are anyway civilians. So one problem is that we just don't enforce the laws on necessity and proportionality properly because they're so unclear. Um, but that's where most of the harm arises in war, actually, is collateral damage. And so it's, it's perhaps a bit, not a mistake exactly, but perhaps our energy is better directed towards thinking about how we better enforce those laws and how those laws might be revised and improved, rather than focusing so much on the question of who we were allowed to target. Um, but taken as a, as a whole, the view is more restrictive than the current laws of war, I would say. Um, because it holds that lots of killing that's currently permitted is impermissible. And it also holds that people shouldn't fight in unjust wars and that they act illegally if they do so, um, which the current laws of war don't punish combatants for fighting in unjust wars. So um, it's kind of difficult to predict exactly what would happen if you change the laws, but I certainly don't think we should just think, oh, it would obviously make things worse. Right? Just because a view permits, says that sometimes it could be permissible to target civilians, we're very used to thinking of civilians as not legitimate targets and soldiers as legitimate targets. But once you agree that soldiers actually aren't legitimate targets and so you recognize that the law already permits widespread injustice, your reasons for sustaining the current law just look a lot weaker. Helen Fro, it was really great talking to you today. Thanks very much for joining us.